All right, so today, uh, today we are talking about the, the sin within us. That's the name of the service. And so we're reading from Romans 7, Romans 7. And so in order for us to understand God, we must understand all aspects of the things we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And so we're reading from Romans 7, Romans 7. And, uh, of course, we understood that last week that in order for us to get closer to God, uh, we must uh, uh, do so in the spirit. We can't just come here every day and, and, and praise God and just give glory to God and, and, and know him closer. No, you get closer through understanding his word and, and uh, getting more in tune to what he can give you, what he can do for you, not what you can do for him. Uh, because how many people understand that God is God? He has all things. He has control of all things. And so it's not what we can do for God. It's what he can do for us. And so the closer you get to him, the more you obtain of his, 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 what he has uh, with the spiritual connection. And so we understand that it's less outward and more inward change that's done by Lord, by the Lord. Um, brings forth the spiritual connection that we're looking for, uh, for on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we also spoke of true sacrificial love, not regular love, not the love that we think, the, 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 the love with the friendship love or anything. We're talking about the true sacrificial love that comes with becoming closer to God. Uh, we also talked about the unshaken happiness that has nothing to do with your outer circumstances. You're happy because God loves you. Uh, we talked we talk about the peace in all areas that comes in spite of what any circumstance you're dealing with. It's peace from God that says that you have peace no matter what's happening in your life. We also talked about patience. Uh, the patience, not the, not the patience because you're going through a, a big trial, but patience all the way around that's given by God. The kindness, the faithfulness, the gentleness that comes from God, the humility that's coming from God and the self-control in the midst of our sins, being able to stop, stop sin. Why? Why? Because you have self-control that only comes from God. And so we understood yet yeah, last week that as we grow spiritually, we, we become closer to the Father. It's not coming here every week and just praising God. It's, it's, it's getting down into understanding who the Lord is and what he has done for you. That brings us closer to the Father. Not running around screaming and jumping up and singing hallelujahs, but understanding the word of God and what he has said for you and said about you and said to you, that brings you closer to God. Well, how many people know that because we talked about these things, the true sacrificial love, the unshaken happiness, the peace in all areas, the patience, the kindness, the faithfulness, the gentleness, the self-control, how many people know that, uh, I, I want to, with a show of hands or a show of amens, how many people understand that that is not as easy as it sounds? Can I get an amen this morning? Amen. We talk about having the faithfulness, the gentleness, the self-control, but and we talk about having the peace of God, but when the first trial comes, your trial, not my trial, my trial you can have peace in. But your trial, when you have your own personal trial that God, because God knows you and he knows what you're going through and what you've dealt with in your life, when you have your own personal trial, how many people know that it's not easy to obtain all of that, to contain all of that, to use the peace that God has given you, to use the, the patience that God has given you? How many people know that patience is difficult when it's in your own trial? Amen. Can I get amen this morning? Amen. So today we're going to discuss why. Why the patience, why the kindness, why the self-control, why all that stuff is difficult and it's not easy and it's tough when you're in Christ Jesus. Because some of us think that because it's difficult, because it's tough, we're not in Christ Jesus. But I'm going to show you this morning, because it's tough, because it's difficult, that you are in Christ Jesus. And so I want you to write this down. Your salvation is not based on challenges. You'll have challenges. You understand that? You will have challenges in your life. You will have trials in your life. But your salvation is not based on those trials or those challenges. Your salvation is simply based on, did you believe in Jesus Christ? So everybody say amen this morning. Amen. Say it loud. Say amen. Amen. So thank the Lord that our salvation is based on our belief. 
and not the works that we've done. Because if it's based on the works that we've done, when we get sick or have an illness and we, 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 we lose faith and everything, anybody ever lost faith because you had some type of trial, but you can see other people go through their trials? Well, thank the Lord that it's not based on the things that we've done. It's all based on the belief in Jesus Christ. And we're going to discuss why it's tough, because it's tough. It's not easy, but it's a lifelong journey for all of us. The moment you believe in Jesus Christ means you are part of his kingdom, which means that you're going to have these challenges for the rest of your life. You can run from God all you want, but you'll still have the challenges. So the best thing to do is to face it forward and understand that that doesn't make you any less a child of God. And so that's why we're speaking uh, from Romans this morning. It doesn't mean that the challenges don't exist because they do. So much so that the Apostle Paul took the time to make sure that you understood that 2,000 years ago, he had challenges. He had challenges just like you had. As a matter of fact, he had them so bad that he expressed it in the word of God. And so I need you to understand that sometimes the enemy wants to make us think that we're not when we are. So we're going to go over that this morning. So the Apostle Paul, he uses strong language to describe himself in these challenges. Why? Because he needed you to understand. He needed you to understand that when you go through challenges, he went through them also. And him being the closest, one of the closest to Jesus, that lets you know that you're okay when we think we're not. Okay, so we're reading from, John, uh, from Romans 7, 14. And this is a highly debated uh, section of scripture. It's highly debated because uh, it's Paul, uh, one of the greatest influential writers of the gospel. He wrote most of the New Testament um, and he's expressing his human flaws. And because he's expressing his human flaws, you've got these theologians who say, well, that, that he's talking about all this sin and all this stuff that he does wrong. He must be talking about prior to him knowing Jesus. But how many people know that that's a lie? Mm -hmm. He's not talking about prior to knowing Jesus. He's talking about right now. He's talking about when you know Jesus. He's talking about when you have accepted Jesus. And so you have to understand that once we understand what Paul is going through, you'll feel much better, more better on what you go through on a day-to-day -day basis. So, um, the theological debate in this scripture is heavy. Because they want to say, well, what he's saying here is before, not after. And you'll find, and I'm going to give you some proof that it was during, he's talking about during his salvation. So as we go over this, I want you to ask yourself this question. Is this something I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis? Can we be true with ourselves this morning? Can we not be church this morning? Can we just be true uh, with the things that you experience on a day-to-day -day basis? Can we do that this morning? Can I get an amen if you amen. agree with that? Amen. So I want you to ask yourself, is this something that I deal with, that, that, that you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis? And so we have two sides of what Paul is discussing here. He's talking about the laws, uh, the laws of God which are the natural, common sense laws of God that he gives us, we know it's natural not to steal. Why? Because we know it's wrong. And so it's the laws, the laws of God um, and that identifies the sinful nature of man. We're talking about the Mosaic laws also. Um, and we're talking about the new nature that comes through Jesus Christ and belief in Jesus Christ. And so, we're, so I want you to write them two things down. We're talking about the laws that identify sin and we're talking about the, 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 the new nature that comes through belief in Jesus Christ. So 2 Corinthians 5.17, I want you to write that scripture down, says this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. Now, some people think because we are new creations that there are no old sinful temptations, no old nature in us. Some people think that because we come to Jesus Christ, all that old stuff is gone, meaning we'll never do it again. And that's where the mix up comes because we look at this scripture that says the old is gone, the new has come, and so when you praise God and give glory to God and believe in Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior, you're like, I'm done with sin, right? Is, 
least that's what we all say. You say, I'm done with sin. And then you go out and do that wrong thing again, or you lie, or you curse, or you scream at somebody, and you have anger, and you, you have jealousy, and all that other stuff, and you say, man, I must not be saved. And that's not true. It's our ignorance that gets us in trouble. And Paul expresses it here in this scripture. And so Paul identifies these two areas that we're talking about. Remember, there's one with the laws of God that identifies sin and then the freedom in Jesus Christ that only comes through our belief. So let's uh, read as Paul identifies the battle that all of us must be aware of. Romans 7, 14 says this. 7, 14 says, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual. So when he says spiritual here, He's talking about because the laws came from God, that makes them spiritual. They came from God. That makes them uh, effective because they came from God. And so because they came from God, it's God's origin that makes the laws spiritual. The laws weren't flawed. Man was. You see? So, so we look at all the laws. We say, oh, man, them laws are crazy. There's no way. It, uh, how many of us have read the laws, the Leviticus? and read the laws and said, oh my goodness, there is no way we could have done all those laws and performed everything according to what God has said. How many of you have said that? Every one of us has said that. If you've read those laws, man, I fell asleep several times reading those laws because they're so detailed. There's so many things that God required of them. And so when I'm looking at it from my fleshly standpoint, I say, man, those laws, there's no way. And so what we understand in writing down is that the laws are not flawed. Man was. Because we have so much sin in us, it's hard for us to fulfill those laws. Why? Because we don't know God like we should. So Paul says this. He says, I, I am, I mean, the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual. Now, when he says, I am unspiritual, first of all, I want you to underline, I am. He didn't say, I was. He didn't say, I used to be before I was saved. He said, I am unspiritual. What does that mean? It means it is current. It means that at the time he wrote this in his salvation, he was unspiritual. Now, how could you be unspiritual if you've just been saved by Jesus Christ? You see that? This is where the battle comes with. This is where people argue about because he says, how, you know, he says, I am unspiritual, even though the law is spiritual. And he says, I am sold as a slave to sin. And so when he says, I am, it's suggesting that Paul is talking about the current state at, in his Christianity, not his past sin. And so that right there knocks out what all of the old logians say when they say, well, maybe he was talking about the old. No, he's talking about the new. He's talking about right then. And so he, he says that. He says, I am unspiritual. And I want you to write this down. It's meaning, as a Christian, he has seeds of rebellion. Oh, uh, I'm helping somebody this morning. As a Christian, he has seeds of rebellion. Write this down also. As a Christian, you will rebel. Do you hear me? Not, not as an unsaved person. Unsaved people rebel anyway. Unsaved people don't even want to know God. But as a Christian, you will rebel. Somebody feel better this morning? Has anybody ever rebelled? This? Is anybody in here? Do we have any rebellers up in here? I'm making up words. Amen. Do we have any people who've ever given up on God? Any people who've got, look, I'm going to tell you, the first time I came to church didn't mean I came every week. People said, you need to come every week. I said, I will when I can. I have too much stuff to do. They said, well, why, well, you were here last week, why were you here this week? Because I didn't have to be here this week. I don't have to be here. I come because I want to when I want to. Rebecca. Mm -hmm. That's what I did. Now I'm sitting at the front talking to y'all about Jesus. Isn't this crazy? Come on. That's right. It's, it's crazy because I rebelled in the beginning. I came when I wanted to come. I came every now and then. I, I started to come. I, I go off and do whatever. I go to the club, come, come to church, uh, come to church, don't go to the club, go to the church, go to the club, not go to church. I do all that stuff. I rebelled. 
That did not mean I did not know Jesus. See, that's where I used to think maybe I didn't know him. But I always ended back up in church. Can I get an amen this morning? Amen. I always ended back up in front of the word of God, even though I rebelled over and over and over again. So I want you to write that down. As a Christian, you will rebel, but that doesn't mean you're not any less Christian because people will tell you, you're not a Christian because you still do that. That's not correct. Now, let's continue on. Uh, he says, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. Uh, now, we were just talking about that word slave. Now, what does the word slave mean? The word slave means one who is owned as the property of someone else. And so as Christians, sin continues to try to claim stakes over your lives. Doesn't mean that you're not free from sin. It means that it's going to continue to try to attack you. Why? Because it wants you to be its slave. Well, uh, let me see. Uh, let, let me give you a good example. Some of us say, well, I'll never lie again, right? And then the temptation comes to lie. You get put in the wrong circumstance. And what do you do? Lie. Everybody say lie. 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 All the liars say, I, amen. amen. All the ones who didn't say man, amen say, I'm a liar. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, it's all of them, not me. <laughs> I can see Brother John saying that. No, it's just you. <laughs> so as a Christian, as a Christian, uh, sins, and sins continue in our life, it tries to claim stake in our lives. And so sin tries to own you over and over and over again. All your life, see, you think it gets better. The more of God you learn, the more sin tries to accomplish attacking you and winning. It does not end. And you can run from God, too, and sin will still consume you. Because you know what? You believed in Jesus Christ. And because you believed in Jesus Christ, sin crouches at your door and tries to attack you. And when it attacks you, when you run away, it attacks you even more. And the first thing you're thinking about, how many people, when you run away from church, what is it? What is it? You're, you're going through your bad things. Your, your household is in disarray. You're going through all those things. And what's the first thing you think about? I need to get back to church. Yeah, I don't even say that. Uh -huh. yes. We all say that. Same thing. You know why? Because sin continues to try to consume you, but it cannot. Why? Because you're in Christ Jesus. You believe. And so the whole gospel, this whole gospel that we read here is based on Jesus purchasing our lives from the penalty of what? Sin. sin. Penalty of sin. His whole death, burial, and resurrection was so that we can be redeemed from what? Sin. Sin. His whole walk in trying to get the Pharisees to go in the right direction and teaching all his people was why? Because of sin. His whole healing and restoration and doing all these things for people is because of sin. It was all based on redeeming people from sin. When he talked to the woman at the well, it was about sin. When he talked to the Pharisees, it was about sin. The Sadducees, it was about sin. When he talked to his disciples, when they were arguing, it was about sin. So, the whole gospel was based on this. Now, let's listen to this next statement because it applies to every Christian in this room. Sometimes we, 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 we get out there in the world and we get confused sometimes. But I need you to understand that what Paul is going through right here because verse 15, he says this, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. Did you hear that? Yes. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. What's he talking about? Well, it's the struggle that, 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 that draws us to confusion over and over again. We know it's right to be in church. How many people know it's right to be in church? How many people have been to church every single Sunday of your lives? Even the, and I'm not talking about the Sundays when you're sick and you just couldn't come. I'm talking about the Sundays when you knew you should be here but did not show up. And here's the funny thing. We know what we should be doing. And so here's what the word says. Paul says, I don't understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. We know it's right. We know where we're supposed to be. 
We know we're supposed to pray every day. We know we're supposed to acknowledge God. We know we're supposed to give glory to God. We know we're supposed to love on God. We know we're supposed to read this word every day. And we know that the word is good, but we do not do it. And so he says, I do not understand what I do. You can place any subject in there. For what I want to do, meaning read the word, I do not do. For what I want to do, meaning go to church, I do not do. For what I want to do, meaning forgive, is what I don't do. What I want to do is not have jealousy, but I do it. And so he says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. I hate jealousy, but yet I have it. I hate anger, but yet I contain it. I hate my revenge, but yet I attack it. Well, we know it's right, and yet we still, yet we still, we know what's right, and yet we still do what's wrong. Isn't that crazy? You know you shouldn't steal. Everybody knows they shouldn't steal. But when that temptation comes, whether it's a pen or whether it's something simple or something complex, whatever it is, when that temptation comes, people do it. So he says, I do not understand what I do for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate to do, I do. Mm, 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 mm. So, he says, for what I hate, I do. This is the constant battle of the believer. We know what is right in Christ, but we are always pulled away into temptation. Tempted to do wrong. We know uh, not to curse. We know not to curse, but yet that there's always that one person who draws you to that limit to where you say, oh, man. Anybody ever had that? We're, we're being true this morning. Mm -hmm. Not all of y'all been in church all your lives. So stop acting like you've never cursed before. What I'm saying here is the, the, the biggest part of us being true with God. You say, I'm not cursing anymore. You know what? Sin crouches at your door and tries to pull you to do that. And so you, you pass the first test in your family. You pass the first test at your job. But then there's that one person who draws it out of you to make you say something that you did not want to say. Can I get an amen this morning? Amen. And if you get past that person, you're in traffic, and then that person pulls at you in front of you, and you call them something that, that only you and God heard. Can <laughs> get an amen for that? <laughs> so, this is a constant battle of the believer. We know that it's wrong to do things. And Paul explains that because he doesn't want to do it, this is powerful. He explains that because he doesn't want to do it, it proves his agreement in the Holy Spirit as to what is right. Watch this, watch this, watch this. Verse 16 says this, And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. Wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. He says, and if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. This is one of my favorite scriptures ever. Of course, all of them are. But I love this one because it took me through some places when I was young and, and, and going into Christianity. He says that if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. What does that mean? What does that mean? It means that he knows right from wrong. He wants to do right even though he did wrong because it attacked him. He still believed that the law was good. You still believe it's right to be in church. You just can't get here every week. Why? Because of the challenges in your life. Because sin crouches at your door. Sin attacks you and sometimes it wins. And you think that it's because you don't know Jesus. But the reason you end up back here is because you did know Jesus. Yeah. Oh, this is good stuff. This is my favorite stuff here. Verse 17, he says, As it is, it is no longer I myself who do, who do it, but it is the sin living in me. Wow. Let's read that again. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is the sin living in me. Look, when, 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 when um, Cain and Abel, when, when, when Cain was about to attack Abel, God said to him, be careful. Sin is crouching. Sin is waiting to, is waiting to devour you. I'm just saying that in many words. He said, be careful. And then from then on, 
Cain still attacked Abel, still murdered Abel. And so sin was waiting there for Cain. Guess what? It's waiting there for you also. What does it mean? It means when you get uh, into a temptation type situation, sin just sits there and it's waiting and it's going to pull you. Why? Because you know right. You know right. And so it sits there and it tries to pull at you and tug at you and, and come on, curse him out. Say something wrong to him. Scream at him. Write something back to him. Send that letter. Send that text message. Be mean. Talk to him in a negative manner. Say bad stuff to him. See, sin crouches and it attacks each and every one of us. Does not mean you do not know Jesus. It means you're human. And you make mistakes. So he says, and if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. And then he says, verse 17, as it is, it is no longer myself, I myself who do it, but it is a sin living with me in me. This establishes the power that sin has over believers, not non-believers. We know sin has power over non-believers. We're talking about us in here. We're trying to grow in here. We're talking about you every day you walk. Sin tries to establish its power over you. And if you don't know this, you think that you're falling away from the gospel, and that's not true. It's because you're in the gospel, because you're trying to learn about Jesus, that the attacks come. And it doesn't end. So this establishes the power that sin has over the believer. And this is after you accept Christ and follow him. The sin living in me is what he says. He says, as it is, it's no longer my, I myself, but it's the sin living in me. The sin living in me, if I, as a believer, know it's wrong to do certain things, the question we ask ourselves, then why do I still accept the temptation every now and then? If I know it's wrong, why do I accept it? If I know it's wrong to steal, why do I accept it every now and then? If I know it's wrong to lie, why do I lie every now and then? If I know it's wrong to cheat, why do I cheat every now and then? If, if I know it's wrong to, 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 to be angry, why do I get angry at people every now and then? Why do I scream at people and do wrong things? Why do I do that? So you got to ask yourself, why is it you do that? Well, it's saying here, it's the sin that lives within you. Now the question is, well, what did Jesus free us of? He frees you of the penalty of that sin that lives within you. The sin's still there. You still have those temptations. You still, see, people think, well, I've been freed of, of being an alcoholic because I took all these classes. No, you have not been freed of it. You just identified the problem. Yes. If you go into a club, you'll still drink. If you go into a bar, you'll still drink. Why? Because you are an alcoholic for life. As long as you live on this earth, sin resides in you. It's all around you. It will attack you in every aspect of your life if you do not understand that. Some of us get all church bound and think we're all in Jesus Christ and think we're sin free. There is no man or no woman on this earth who is sin free. I need you to understand that because sometimes we lift people up too high. We say, no, not that bishop. Yes, that bishop. That's why people get upset because they put people on pedestals that they shouldn't be on. Amen. So write this, write this down. At times, every believer relinquishes control to sin within them. Oh, this is difficult for folks. Folks hear this, folks who are going to hear this, they're going to say, man, I can't believe he said that. <laughs> At times, every believer, and I didn't say not just us, I'm saying every single believer in Jesus Christ relinquishes control to sin that's within them. Look, if we can't say that, that, that Paul did it, but no other pastor would do it. We can't say that Paul did it, but no other bishop would do it. We can't say that Paul did it, but no other man would have sinned. Every single one of us has the ability and will give in to sin once, twice, three times, whenever in their lives. So I need you to understand that because sometimes you go through things and you do things wrong and you condemn yourself for things that God has already forgiven you of and you let yourself, you let it be a reason to run away from God when it's a reason to run to God. We say, I can't do that because I've been doing the wrong things. No, no, because you've been doing the wrong things, you should come to God. 
I can't go to church no more. I've done the wrong thing. No, you can go to church because you've done the wrong things. In here is a bunch of misfits. We've all done wrong things. Can I get an amen this morning? Amen. None of us are right. Can I get an amen this morning? Paul said it. None of us are righteous. We come here because God has given us grace. He has released us and given us mercy. And so when we do wrong, we accept it and say, God, forgive me, and we're done with it, and we continue on with our walk in Christ. So, he says here, verse 18, <laughs> watch it. Verse 18, he says, for I know that good itself does not dwell in me. Oh, wow. This is powerful. <laughs> It says, for I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. Because people take this and say, well, what about the Holy Spirit? But he, he confirmed it and said, in my sinful nature. When you are lying, remember I said you have to put down the Spirit of God to grasp all the things that are of this world. You can't have them both. In order to have faith, you walk in Christ. In order to lie, you have to put down Christ to grab the lock. In order to, to walk in, in, in envy, you have to put down faith in Jesus Christ, love in Jesus Christ to grab on to envy. So you can't hold them both at the time. So once you, one, you're in your sinful nature, the other, you're in Christ. So he says, wow. He says in verse 18, he says, for I know that Good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot, not will not, I cannot carry it out. Has anybody ever had that problem in here? Amen. You know you're supposed to forgive. You know you're supposed to say, I'm sorry. You know you're supposed to repent and give it to God. You know you're supposed to just have faith. The word says when you've done all you can, just stand. But you're walking and talking and trying to change things on your own. You know you're just supposed to sit and wait on God, but you do things on your own. Has anybody ever had that problem? Amen. When you want to do right, but you just can't carry it out. I'm not talking about you all righteous folks who you want to do right and then something changes you and you do everything right. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about the down, dirty folks who sometimes you just can't do it. God, you're, you're mad. You're so angry. You're so upset that you want to do right, but you cannot at that moment. Anybody ever had that experience? According to the scripture, the apostle Paul, the same man who was blinded by Jesus, he had the same problem, and yet he was in salvation. Paul is simplifying the fact that the redeemed sinner has a carnal body of flesh, and yet a Holy Spirit that is of God, and they're constantly at war with each other. Do you understand that? We, uh, the, the scripture confirms itself over and over again. It's going to be a constant battle with war over your spirit and your flesh. It doesn't mean that your flesh finally wins or your spirit finally wins. Your spirit, just, because you have the Holy Spirit, you've already obtained, you are already a believer in Christ Jesus. But it does not mean while you're here on this earth, you will not have battles back and forth between your flesh and your spirit. This is what we're talking about, family. You've got to understand that. So Paul is simplifying that the redeemed sinner has a carnal body. And the Holy Spirit constantly wars with your flesh. Galatians 5.17, I want you to write this down. We were in Galatians last week. Galatians 5.17 confirms that by saying this. I want to read this to you. It says, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit. And the spirit was contrary to the flesh. And then it says, they are in conflict with each other. You want to go to church, something gets in your way, you don't go. You want to go to church, you overcome what's gotten in your way, something happens to your vehicle, and you make an excuse not to go. You want to go to church, but you, you wake up late. Anybody ever done that? You wake up late, say, I might as well not go. <laughs> Everything will get in your way. Why? Because your sinful nature wants to give you a reason not to go. It wants to give you a reason to avoid God. Write this down. Because you are a believer, 
Because you are a believer, you will have this battle. And it doesn't end. You understand that? It doesn't end. <laughs> we, we think it's going to get better. It doesn't get better. It gets heavier. It continues to attack you. It continues to try to destroy you. Something because you have to struggle, you are not saved. It's not the truth. Paul said, I do not understand what I do. And he's the apostle Paul. He was starting all these churches, Galatians, Ephesians. And he was starting all these churches. He was going around on, on ships and, and doing all this preaching of the gospel, being arrested, being beaten, being thrown into jail. And yet that man who was blinded by Jesus came down, and Jesus came down and spoke and taught him and, and, and did everything about, about teaching him about the word of God. And so Paul became official. And then he says, I don't understand what I do. Because what I want to do, I don't do. I, I, I can't feel it. And sometimes I want to get up, but I don't get up. Sometimes I want to not lie, but I lie. Sometimes I don't, don't want to steal, but I steal. Sometimes I don't want to cheat, but I cheat. You know, they, Paul is saying, look, I have these problems. Verse 19 and 20. Verse 19 and 20 says this. For I do not do the good I want to do. Wow. But the evil I do not want to do, this I keep doing. Wow. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil that I do not want to do, this I keep doing. Anybody ever had that problem? No. You've got a pastor, pastor told you, please, just forgive him. Forgive him. Let it go. Let it go. Then you chase him down. Forgive him. No, no, I gave him a ring. I gave him this. I gave him that. I gave him a car. I gave him all that. Let it all go. They ask me, yeah, y'all, all the people come to me and say, Pastor, what should I do? Why do you ask me for advice you're never going to take? <laughs> well, if you want to know what the word says, the word says you should forgive them. The word says you should just let it go. It's material stuff. Why are you worried about the bank account? Why are you worried about the cars? Why are you worried about all that stuff? Let it go. Then you call me and say, I'm in jail. Why? Because I messed up my car. It was my car. <laughs> <laughs> so he says, verse 20, now if I do not do what I want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it's a sin living in me that does it. <laughs> Prior to accepting Jesus, we had only one nature. That was the nature of sin. It's prior to Jesus. Now we have the sin and the spirit. So if you're in the world, you can avoid God for the rest of your life and walk in sin and do all the crazy things and make this right. And you know, you remember everybody remember when you were in the world when you thought sin was good? Like that's cool. I love going out. I love getting drunk too. I can't say my name. You know, I love all that stuff. <laughs> I love people be taking me home and I don't realize what I've done. I mean, come on, y'all. Y'all haven't been to church all your lives. How many people have ever, uh, well, not experienced, but seen somebody drunk before? Amen. Amen. You see, y'all say that real fast. <laughs> but, you know, if we all say the same thing. It's funny. We, we talk about this. And say, man, no, I never, man, I, I, you know, you thought sin was good at that time. It was fun. It's here the funny thing. I'll never do that again. I've even said that before. Yeah. Yeah. You woke up from a hangover. And say, I'm not talking to, look, we in church this morning. We tell the truth. <laughs> you wake up and say, I'll never do that again. The next week, let's go out. Okay. <laughs> Isn't that what we do? Yeah. Jumping on tables, <laughs> knocking stuff over, talking to people about crazy. I've always liked you. You know, crazy stuff. <laughs> I don't know what I was talking about. You say crazy stuff, and then you wake up the next day and say, "What did I do?" And you say, "I'll never do it again." The next thing you're doing the same thing. Why? Because at that time we had one nature, and that nature said sin was fun. <laughs> Verse uh, 21 says this. <laughs> so I find this law, meaning this principle he's talking about, I find this principle at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. Yes. Wow. Isn't that crazy? It doesn't leave. Evil is always there. Why? Because you've accepted Jesus Christ. Yeah. Stop acting like it's going to end and you're going to be righteous and everything's going to be perfect. Righteousness only comes through Jesus Christ. It doesn't come through your acts. 
So you've got to know to repent and to move on, to accept Christ, because evil is crouching at your door and it wants to destroy you. Amen. Verse 22 says, For in my inner being I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. Wow. So when he's saying God's law, he's talking about the Mosaic law. And I need you to get something here. He's talking about the Mosaic law. And he's saying, um, he's saying verse 22, for my inner being, I delight in God's law. If he's talking about the Mosaic law, non-Christians would never say this. Non-Christians would never say, I delight in the laws of Moses. So to say it's an unsaved person saying that, Paul, when he was unsaved, is not correct. This is Paul when he knows Jesus, when he has accepted Christ, and he's referring to Christianity. He said, I love the Mosaic law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. Wow. So how many people have said, man, I love me some Jesus. I love me some Jesus. I want to serve God. I want to walk in righteousness. I accept him. But then your mind says something else. Your mind says, why did they do that to me at church? Why did they treat me in that manner? Why are they talking to me in that manner? Why, why, why? How many people said that? Can I get an amen? Because every one of y'all have been offended before of something in this church or another church. You left other churches because you got offended there. And then you came here and said, I'm coming here because I won't get offended. And then you get offended by something here. We don't even know what you're mad about. Come on, Can I help you this morning? Because we all have been offended before. But that mind, that, that wire that we have when we get offended is the evil of sin that's crouching at you and this whole purpose is not just to make you mad but to pull you away from God's word. Isn't it okay to be offended and be at church? Isn't it okay to be offended and be in the word of God? We give in to the enemy when we're offended and we allow him to win. Wow. Y'all quiet this morning. I like this. <laughs> another, when he says another law, he's talking about the constant battle of Christians, God's law battling with sin that's within us. Now, verse 24, he says, What a wretched man or wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Wow. He says he calls himself in scripture a wretched man. His honest evaluation of who he is compared to the value of God's grace. Sometimes we don't say that enough to ourselves. Sometimes we think we're holier than thou. Sometimes we think we're too righteous. Instead of saying, I'm not worthy. I can't believe God has chosen me. I do not understand his grace. His glory makes, makes me lie on my face. His glory made me cry out this morning. His glory made the, man and women, the men and women get down on their feet this morning. His glory makes us raise our hands. Why? Because we realize that we're nothing. Yeah. And he's everything. Yeah. And because we're nothing and he's everything and he's done something for us, it's just like the president coming to your house and saying, hey, I've been looking for you. It's not even close to that. God is everything, we're nothing, and yet he still chose us, and we still continue to rebel, go in our left direction, say wrong things, and go in our, and not forgive, and do all that other stuff, and he says, I still love you, because my love is not based on anything that you can do or have done. I've chosen you before the beginning of time to be righteous and holy and blameless in my sight, in spite of your anger, in spite of your bitterness, in spite of your rivalry, in spite of your unforgiveness, in spite of your jealousy, in spite of your envy, in spite of your wrath, in spite of all that stuff, I have forgiven you. The least we can do is love him. Yeah. And we love him. I hope you get it. It is your duty to walk as a Christian. It is your duty to understand these principles. 
You will do wrong again. You will make mistakes again. But because your desire is to do right, Paul is saying you know God because of that. But understand, none of us are righteous. None of us are right. None of us are perfect. All of us rebel. All of us reject God. But he still loves us. And we got to walk like that. We got to understand that we're all wretched. Paul saying, what, what a, he said, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? He says, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So then, this is the most powerful part, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. Look, you're going to be a slave to both of them. You're going to be a slave to righteousness and a slave to unrighteousness. What does that mean? It means that you know Jesus, you believe in him, but you'll still be attacked and you'll still accept it sometimes. And so it's so hard to believe that Christians struggle. That's what people have a problem with. It's hard to believe that we struggle. We struggle all the time. Do you not know that? We struggle. It's part of the nature. When you come to Christ, you are a new creation with old tendencies, meaning you will struggle in Christianity. How many people wonder, am I in Christ? Do I know Jesus? Have I accepted him? Am I walking right? Am I in the right church? Am I, do I do the right things? Do I walk in the right direction? Should I forgive? Should I love? We, we struggle with that all the time, but it doesn't mean you're not a Christian. I need you to acknowledge and understand that you are in Christ because you believe in Jesus Christ. From then on, it's the salvation walk that becomes the process. To sum this up, When we see ourselves in the comparison to who God is, we understand that we are unworthy. We understand how right, unrighteous we are. We understand how non-deserving we are. And we understand how merciful our Lord is. 25 sums it up by letting the believers know that we are slaves to both of these natures. It is so hard for us to believe, but we struggle. We're human. We have flesh. We make decisions. We make bad decisions. We don't trust God all the time. So it sums it up by saying Paul teaches us that as a believer, you will have a true struggle between the ways of God and the ways of your flesh. Your mind will battle back and forth. The word says that the mind is an enemy to God. Why? Because you try to overthink stuff. Mm -hmm. You try to overthink your righteousness. You try to overthink your salvation. Understanding this will help you to understand that you are not on the wrong track like the enemy would have you to believe. Some of you think, I should be further in my walk. And God says, you're exactly where you need to be in your walk. Some of y'all say, man, I should be further. I should be doing this ministry, doing that ministry. I should know you're exactly where God needed you to be at this time. Yes. Accept that, and then you can move forward. Stop condemning yourself for something that God has placed you in. The enemy does not have the authority to destroy you, but you do. As a matter of fact, on the contrary, you are on the right track. You're just a threat to the enemy's plan. So to deter you, he uses your lack of knowledge to make you think you could not know God. And he, contend he condemns you with sin that you've been forgiven of by Jesus Christ. So he uses, the Bible says people perish for their lack of knowledge. He uses our lack of knowledge to make us think we're unrighteous. We're not worthy. And here's the problem. It's true. We are not righteous. We are not worthy. But through Jesus Christ, we are. So acknowledge that, that what God says, not what the enemy says. Because he'll be out there waiting to crouch on you when you leave here. He'll crouch on your household, try to attack your household in every aspect of your life. But if you acknowledge and understand who you are, then you know, I walk in righteousness. I am the righteousness of God. I am redeemed of sin. I am forgiven. No weapon formed against me 
will prosper. Every tongue that rises against me shall be condemned. I walk in the favor of God. I expect the unexpected in my life. I know the enemy taps me, but when he's acknowledged, he like a flood, he must leave in seven different directions. There is no righteousness in me, but there is righteousness in Jesus Christ. I have the mind of Christ. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. He's going to attack you again. Why? Because we've just been exposed to the righteousness of God. Yes. Know that it's the sin within you that causes you to do the things you do. But the fact that you believe was because of God. And that's all you need. is to know that you believe in Jesus Christ and you have just as much access to the kingdom as I have access to the kingdom. So for that alone, I need you to stand to your feet and give God glory in the house of the Lord because he has accepted you as Christ. Here on out, don't let anybody tell you different. You have been blessed of the Lord and give God glory in his house because you have trusted him and believed in him. And because of that, you know Jesus. Amen. Can you give God glory to have Amen.